Okay, this is part two of the PY1PR lecture about the t-test which will follow on from last week's lecture which described in detail the independent samples t -test. What we are going to cover this week is the reporting of t-tests as performed in SPSS in your workshops. A new topic called the 95% confidence interval of the difference. Another new topic called the effect size. And then we're going to look at a variation of the t-test called the related samples t-test, which is used when the same group of participants take part in both experimental conditions. We'll also look at uh, another variation of the t-test called the one sample t-test, which is when you just want to compare the results from a single sample who've done one test to a fixed value. And we'll finish with some notes on reporting and interpreting significant results and also the tricky non-significant results. So last week we used an example where participants were given either blueberries every day or sugar cubes every day and we uh, looked at the dependent variable of their exam scores. And this paragraph below is how you would uh, do a full report of that experiment if you'd actually conducted it. Now I'm not going to read out the paragraph, I'll give you a minute to read it yourself. Now you will have noticed that some of those statistics were covered last week, such as the, uh, the T value and the P value here, but some of those things like the effect size were not, and neither was the 95% um, confidence interval of the difference. So we're going to break down that paragraph uh, and look at it in sections. We'll do it not quite in the same order as we saw it in the last slide. Um, we'll begin looking at the things you that have already been covered. This section here, participants in the blueberry condition achieved higher exam scores than those in the control condition and the mean difference between conditions was 6.7 percent. And then we'll look at the actual report of the t-test and its associated p-value. Then we'll come on and finally look at how we deal with the 95% confidence interval of the difference and the effect size. Okay, so we always begin by reporting descriptive statistics. Whenever you report any statistical analysis, you report uh, the descriptives before you report those statistics called inferential statistics that produce p-values. So t is an example of an inferential statistic and so we report the means and standard deviations which are the uh, descriptive statistics which are being tested by that t-test before we report the actual t-test. So you can see we've now got a little bit saying what the um, means were in the two experimental conditions and what the standard deviations were associated with those means. Okay, let's look at the SBSS output for the independent samples t-test. Then once we find the relevant numbers we can look at how it's reported. So what's being highlighted by the green circle in the top part of this slide 
is where you get the means and standard deviations from for each experimental condition in the t-test output. Now the green circle in the bottom part of the slide highlights where I got the mean difference from which I included in the paragraph. Of course you could calculate the mean difference yourself just by subtracting one condition mean from the other condition mean but there it is, SPSS has done it for you. So we write that an independent samples t-test revealed that the difference was statistically significant with t 58 in brackets equals 2.58 p equals 0 0.06 one tailed so where does that come from well i've highlighted in the table here with the dashed green line where the t statistic is reported by sbss the solid green circle highlights where the degrees of freedom come from and that's what goes in brackets always after the letter T is the degrees of freedom. And that'll be the same for other types of statistics that you will learn about later in the course, such as R. You always have the degrees of freedom associated with the calculation in brackets. Now, let's... Now I've underlined the second part of the statement that P is 0. 0.06 one tailed. Now where that comes from is actually in this section of the table that I've highlighted with the green circle called SIG two tailed. And notice that the number here is actually 0 0.01 sorry 0 0.012 and that I have written 0 0.006 and that is because SPSS always reports two-tailed significance values. But in the example of the blueberry experiment, the researchers predicted that the blueberries would improve exam performance. And therefore, it's a one-tailed test, and you divide the significance value given by SPSS by two. Now, just a little bit on terminology here. Uh, what SPSS is calling SIG two-tailed I generally have been referring to as P two-tailed so significance and P generally mean the same thing just two different terminologies for the same thing here this slide just emphasizes the fact that the P value was divided by two because it was a two-tailed p-value given by SPSS, but we had a one-tailed prediction. Now, a common mistake that people make when they have a one-tailed prediction is to not divide the p-value by two, but instead divide the value of t by two. Don't make that mistake. Now, let's just remind ourselves that if the researchers had not been sure as to whether blueberries uh, were like were going to improve exam performance if they thought that they would change exam performance but they weren't sure whether they would make them better or worse then they would have used a two-tailed prediction which would mean you would use the value from SPSS without first dividing it by two. Okay let's move on to look at the 95% confidence interval of the difference. In our report, we wrote that the 95% confidence interval for the estimated population mean difference is between 1.5 and 11.9%. Now that really has a very similar meaning to the 95% confidence interval of a single sample mean, which was covered earlier in the course in the context of all those UK and Greek cats. Now, because it's the 95% confidence interval of a, dif of a difference rather than of a single sample mean, what it means here is that we're 95% sure that the true effect in the overall population 
of blueberry supplementation on this type of exam score is to produce a real benefit of somewhere between 1.5% and 11.9% improvement in the exam scores. So that's a useful reminder not to take the exact results of your experiment too seriously because what that's telling you is that there's actually a range of values um, that it's likely the real difference lies within. Now let's look at where to find the 95% confidence interval of the difference in the SPSS output and of course you'll be producing this output for yourselves in your workshop. So here we see highlighted in green uh, the lower and the upper ranges of the 95% confidence interval of the difference. Now let's move on to look at an important statistic called the effect size. In our report which we started the lecture with we wrote which is a medium effect size D equals 0.66. Now SPSS does not include effect size in the output um, even though it's an important statistic. And the reason SPSS doesn't include it is just because there isn't uh, a consensus among different statisticians on the exact type of um, effect size measure to use. I use uh, Cohen's D, um, Andy Field in the textbook uses a different effect size measure, so for this course use the measure that I describe in these slides. Now the best way to understand what is meant by effect size is to compare it with the meaning of p-values. And we will do that by trying to make a comparison between two experiments. And we'll try to ask which of the two experiments has produced a larger or more important effect. So the first experiment is the one that we've already been using last week and so far today where it's blueberries versus sugar cube control and the dependent variable is the exam scores and we wrote didn't we that an independent t-test revealed that the difference was statistically significant t 58 equals 2.58 P equals 0.006 one tailed. Note that actually I inserted the word highly there. People often write highly significant when P is smaller than 0.01. Now let's imagine another experiment where instead of blueberries, people were given an extra revision session. And the control group weren't given the extra revision session. The dependent variable once again is exam scores and this time we get also a significant result but we write that an independent t-test revealed that the difference was statistically significant t 25 equals 2.23 p equals 0.017 one-tailed now, <clears throat> we can see, can't we, that the, P, the T value is smaller in the um, revision example than in the blueberry example. And we know that when T is smaller, it's more likely that the data could be obtained just by random sampling under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. Also, the p-value in the uh, revision example is larger. 0.017 is a larger p-value than 0.006. Still smaller than 0.05, which is our conventional cutoff for declaring significance. But it's closer to that cutoff, isn't it? So it's more likely that these data could happen by chance sampling effects if the null hypothesis was true. Now, in this situation, when making this kind of comparison, 
Many people are intuitively tempted to think that the blueberries are having a larger or more important effect than the revision. But actually, given the information you have on the last slide, this is a comparison that you cannot make. You don't have the information on that slide to tell you which of the two independent variables had a larger effect on the outcome measure. And that, if you think back to last week, is because your t-statistic is actually in part dependent on the sample sizes and the variation in the samples. So a general rule is don't overinterpret p-values. Now a few slides from now we will use um, effect size measures to compare the two experiments we just talked about on the previous couple of slides instead of using t and p values to compare them. So general rules about p values are that although when someone writes highly significant because the p-value is smaller than 0 0.01 um, instead of just writing significant which is what they tend to write when the p-value is less than 0 0.05 but more than 0 0.01 don't let that fool you into um, treating that highly significant effect as a more important one because to do so is to misinterpret the meaning of the p-value. What we've been learning over the last couple of weeks is that p is merely the probability of data as different as that reported or more different than that reported being obtained if the null hypothesis was true and you just had two samples picked from an imaginary identical population. So a highly significant effect is just one that is very unlikely to have arisen due to the variation that is inherent in the random sampling process. So let's take a look at how to calculate the Cohen's D effect size. Now of course the simplest effect size measure is just the difference between the means in the two experimental conditions. But that fails to take into account um, the variability in the data. And it is good to take the standard deviation into account when considering the size of the experimental effect. So Cohen's D is actually a bit like a z-score. It's a z-score of the difference. And like z-scores, it has units of standard deviation. Here's the formula for Cohen's D. And it's actually the same as the T formula, except that sample size is not part of the equation. So it doesn't take into account the sample sizes. It just takes into account the size of the effect of the independent variable, which is indicated on the top half of the equation here, the numerator. And it just divides that by a pooled estimate of the variability in the experiment. So standard deviation condition 1 plus standard deviation condition 2 divided by 2. So it's going to be quite easy to calculate. So for the blueberry experiment example, these were the means and standard deviations. And if we plug them into the formula, we get a value of D of 0 0.67. So that means that the difference of 6.7% in terms of exam score between the two groups was equal to 0 0.67 standard deviation units, like having a z-score 0.67. Now, these were the numbers that you haven't seen before for the extra revision example. 
in that t-test the uh, raw data had condition means like this the revision group had a mean of 60.8 percent and the control group had a mean exam score of 50.5 percent and the standard deviations were 11 and 13. So it's actually a bigger effect, isn't it? If you look at the difference between the two experimental conditions, that's going to be 10.3. Uh, Divide that by the standard deviation pooled is 0 0.86. That's a larger effect size. Even though the uh, T statistic was larger and the p-value smaller, we actually have a bigger effect size for revision than we did for blueberries. And I'm making an error here on this slide because I say here this is a bigger effect size than blueberries despite the fact that t was smaller and p was larger for, and that should say, revision instead of what it does say. Okay, there are some rules that were set up by Cohen when he created the effect size statistic that I use for interpreting uh, in words for the purposes of written reports the, um, the numbers that come out of the effect size calculation. If you get a Cohen's D of 0.2 or less, that's a small effect. If you get a Cohen's D of between 0.2 and 0.5, well, that's small to medium. 0.5 is medium. Get up to 0.8, that's large. If it's more than 1, particularly if it's more than 1.5, that's a very large effect. So Andy Field doesn't use Cohen's D. He uses R as an effect size measure. And in this course, we'll use Cohen's D. OK? Okay, let's move on to the next topic uh, in the lecture, the related samples or repeated measures t-test. And this is the t-test you use when the same group of participants take part in both experimental conditions. And you can do that uh, where it's practical to do so. So in the blueberry and control group example it wouldn't be practical to do so because you know you've only got one exam that these people are going to take so you can't have people doing both the blueberries and the control condition but in plenty of experimental situations you can work out a way of doing it so that you can get the same people doing both experimental conditions now with the related samples t-test, there's a slightly different formula for calculating the value of t and for calculating the degrees of freedom. But everything else about the t-test stays the same. It still actually has the same distribution under the null hypothesis as we looked at last week. Um, and the interpretation is the same. So to understand how this related t-test differs from the independent t-test, we're going to consider uh, a simple experiment that you could perform using either experimental method, either the independent samples method or the related samples method. And that experiment is to test a two-tailed hypothesis that reaction times in the afternoon are different from those in the morning. So for the independent samples version of the experiment, this is what a data table um, looks like. And I'm just using a small experiment, just five participants in each of the two samples, just to illustrate the points I want to make. So participants one to five have their reaction time measured in the morning and participants 6, 7, 8, 9 and 10 have their reaction time measured in the afternoon. And these are reaction times in seconds here. 
So you can see that most people's reaction times are kind of about half a second. These two people here, quite slow. Okay, so the mean reaction time in the morning is 0 0.66 seconds. And the mean reaction time in the afternoon is 0 0.56 seconds, which is a little bit quicker. So maybe reaction times are a bit quicker in the afternoon. But <coughs> we can see that the standard deviations are quite large, aren't they? Standard deviation is 0 0.38 in the morning group which is you know more than half the size of the mean and it's 0 0.33 in the afternoon group which again is more than half the size of the mean and it's actually larger than the difference between the two experimental conditions which is only 0 0.1 so we've got a lot of variability here and a small effect of the independent variable so it looks unlikely that we'd get a significant difference if we ran a t-test. Now, <coughs> if you did run the t-test, it would not produce a significant result, because as I said, the standard deviations are larger than the actual effect of the independent variable. In other words, the variation between the individuals is bigger than the variation due to the independent variable. And of course, this also has a small sample size. But even with a big sample size, uh, maybe 30 in each group, with those standard deviations and those means, you'd struggle to get a significant result. Now, let's imagine, uh, for purposes of illustration, that the same 10 data points were obtained, but this time we only used five people, and those five people were tested twice each once in the morning, once in the afternoon. Now what we can do in that situation, which we can't do in the independent samples situation, is to actually calculate a difference score for each participant. And then we can perform the t-test calculation on the difference score rather than performing it on the raw scores. And we'll see how that is quite a helpful thing. Okay, now I've reconfigured the data table to be uh, relevant for a related samples version of the reaction time experiment. I've got the same actual numbers as before, but whereas before these numbers came from participants 1 to 5, and these numbers came from participants 6 to 10, now there are only 5 participants. Peter gives us both of these data points. Sarah gives us both of these data points, etc. And what we can see is that the person who is the slowest, Henry, is always the slowest, whether it be in the morning or the afternoon. And the person who is the fastest, I think that's John, is the fastest, whether it's in the morning or the afternoon. And that reflects what we saw in the earlier independent samples version of this, i.e. that there are big differences between people in terms of reaction time. So what we're doing by getting people to do the experiment in both the morning and the afternoon is getting them to act as a control for themselves. And that's the big advantage of the related samples experimental design. So with this experimental design, we can go on and calculate a different score for each person. So what I've done here is morning reaction time minus afternoon reaction time. And because this is just an illustrative example, everybody is a little bit quicker in the afternoon than they are in the morning, which is why those are negative numbers. And there's the mean difference of 0.1 seconds, which is the same mean difference that we had in the independent samples uh, version of this experiment. Now, in a bit, we'll do the sums, we'll work out the actual uh, t-statistic for that 
related samples reaction time experiment. But first let's consider why it is that the error term, that's the denominator in the T equation, tends to be smaller in related samples experiments. Well basically it's smaller because we can calculate it using the different scores, not the raw scores. And that means that where there are big individual differences between participants, those individual differences are cancelled out before we calculate our estimate of the standard error. And they don't serve to inflate the standard error. Whereas in the independent samples t-test, those between participant differences are feeding into the error term, so you're dividing by a bigger error term. Of course, this isn't always an advantage. Um, sometimes the, uh, there are not meaningful individual differences in what you're measuring, um, or rather the performance is not correlated between the two time points between individuals, and then it doesn't get you an advantage to use the related samples method, but usually it does. So, as I said earlier, another way to think about this is that each participant acts as their own control condition. So let's say we're doing an experiment which is not about personality, but we're worried that personality could be what we discussed last week using the word confounding variable. Personality could have influenced the dependent variable, even though we're not actually interested in personality. So personality is a confound. <laughs> So let's say we're doing an experiment with quite small sample sizes because we don't have much resources to run the experiment and we're worried that extroversion is a confounding variable and we know that we're doing random allocation to conditions so we hope to get the same number of extroverts in both experimental groups in the independent samples version of the experiment but um, that might not happen because of the small sample sizes. We might not get a balance just due to the nature of random allocation. So the related samples design just goes uh, a bit further in giving us a better control over this potential confound because um, it's no longer possible to randomly end up with all the extroverts in one experimental condition. You know, because your extroverts are doing both experimental conditions and so are your introverts. So therefore we tend to use related samples designs whenever it's possible to do so. Because it's often better for detecting small effects of independent variables. But as I said earlier, the nature of the independent variable sometimes prevents from same participants from taking part in both conditions. You know, if you've got material that uh, people could only be exposed to once before they are over familiar with it, and that will be the case. Um, and as I said on the last slide, the related samples design is also tends to work better when the sample sizes are small. And just to note, um, on the meaning of the null hypothesis in the related samples design. The null hypothesis is that the sample of different schools comes from an imaginary population of different schools that itself has a mean of zero. You don't need to worry about that too much, but technically that's what the null hypothesis is for a related sample. Okay, let's take a look at the formula for uh, the related samples t-test, which I've got up here on the top half of the slide, and then we'll compare it with the formula for the um, related samples, sorry, independent samples t-test. Now, the formula for the related samples t-test is actually pretty simple. You just get the mean of the different schools, and that's the same as the difference between the two experimental conditions or the difference between the mean of experimental condition 1 and the mean of experimental condition 2 and you divide that by the standard error of the difference scores and you calculate that by taking the standard deviation of the difference scores 
and dividing it by the square root of the number of people who took part in the experiment. Now mathematically that standard error formula is actually the same standard error formula that you used a couple of weeks ago for calculating the standard error of a single sample mean. So it's a pretty simple formula actually. And you can see how the raw data don't actually enter into this formula anywhere because we begin with the different scores. Now compare that with last week's formula for the independent samples t-test which obviously looks rather more complicated um, but it's because it's having to take into account the uh, standard deviations of the two samples separately and because you can't use the different scores. Okay, let's look at a worked example of the related samples t-test using the uh, small illustrative example of the reaction time experiment. So here I've copied the reaction time different scores for the five participants from the earlier slide. Peter is a tenth of a second faster in the afternoon and in the morning, and so is Sarah. John is a twentieth of a second faster in the afternoon, and so is Jane. Henry is two tenths of a second faster in the afternoon than he was in the morning. So the mean difference score is a tenth of a second. Now the standard deviation of those five scores is 0.061 and the number of people in the experiment is 5. So we can calculate our standard error as 0 0.061 divided by the square root of 5. So the square root of 5 is 2.22, sorry, 2.23. And if you do 0 0.061 divided by 2.23 comes out as 0 0.027. So then we get our so that is our standard error, 0 0.027. We then divide our mean difference by our standard error. So minus 0.1 divided by 0 0.027 um, comes out with a t-value of minus 3.65. Remember I said it doesn't matter whether the t is positive or negative, it just depends which way around you calculate the difference. So the p-value for that t-value when there are four degrees of freedom, as there are in this experiment, turns out to be 0.02, two-tailed. Remember, the experimenters weren't sure whether people would be faster in the afternoon or slower in the afternoon, so it was a two-tailed hypothesis, and they've got a significant difference with just five participants. Of course, this is a slightly artificial example because all five participants showed the same direction of effect and that's rare in practice. So what about relating, sorry, what about reporting the related samples t-test? Well it's actually the same as for the independent samples t-test. In the example we would write it took longer to respond in the morning than the afternoon. T four degrees of freedom equals minus 3.65 p equals 0 0.02 two-tailed. So the formula for degrees of freedom in a related samples t-test is just n minus 1. Very simple but SPSS will give you that number in the output anyway. Now an issue that you tend to come across in any related samples design is order counterbalancing. And you need to do order counterbalancing to pre prevent two common experimental confounds known as order effects. Now you get two common types of order effect. You get practice, that is the more often the same person performs the same type of test, the better they do on it. And you get fatigue. That is, the more often somebody does something, the more bored or tired they get, and the worse they get. And in different situations, you get different combinations of practice and fatigue. So in the 
reaction time example, if everybody had been tested first in the morning and then tested in the afternoon, well, people do tend to get faster at reaction time tests the more they do them. So order of testing would then be a confound in the experiment if everybody was tested first in the morning and then in the afternoon. Practice could explain the fact that they ended up being faster in the afternoon rather than it being a genuine effect on the time of day. It's fairly easy to uh, deal with this confound. Um, you would just test half the participants in the morning, then in the afternoon. The other half would be tested first in the afternoon and then in the morning. But note, um, doing this counterbalancing does not remove the variation in reaction time that occurs due to practice from the data. And people often fall into the trap of thinking that it does remove that variation. It doesn't. That variation is still there. It just makes that variation into what Andy Field calls unsystematic variation with respect to the independent variable. In effect, that variation due to the practice effect will increase the size of the standard error, increase the error term but it will no longer have an effect on the difference between the two experimental conditions in terms of the means. <coughs> OK, let's move on to look at the one sample t-test, which I'll explain um, using an example. So let's imagine that uh, we know from a very big uh, sort of survey, kind of a census, that um, alcohol consumption in the age 18 to 22 group of people is 15 units per week on average. But let's say we've got a hypothesis that students of that age drink more than non-students of that age. So one way to test this hypothesis would be to get a sample of students and then a sample of non-students and ask them how much they drink and compare the two. But another way of doing it in this case, because we know that a really good estimate of the population mean for the non-students, or sorry, for the population in general, is um, just to collect a sample of students and compare them in terms of how much they drink with that known population parameter. And in this case, that known population parameter will actually constitute the null hypothesis. Because if I'm wrong, and there is no difference between students and other young people in terms of how much they drink, then the null hypothesis is that in terms of what they drink, students are actually from the same population as everybody else, and that students also have a mean consumption of 15 units of alcohol per week. OK, so let's take a look at um, what a data table and a worked example might look like for a one sample t-test. Here we're just going to use the same five people that we used in our reaction time ex example for the related samples t-test. But the data table will be a little bit different. For each person, we've got data on how much alcohol they consume per week in units of alcohol. Peter consumes 20 units, Sarah consumes 60 units, John 10 units, etc. Now, each person is compared directly with the null hypothesis value of 15 units. So we calculate a difference from the null hypothesis for each person. So Peter drinks five more units of alcohol per week than the null hypothesis. Remember, the null is the data from the population that we know about from the big survey. On the other hand, John drinks five units less than the null hypothesis, and Jane three units less. Now, on average, as a group, they have a mean consumption of 
of 15.2 units per week, which is ever so slightly more than the uh, null hypothesis value. And you can see that reflected here in the mean of the different scores, which is obviously 15 plus 0.2 equals 15.2. Now the formula for calculating the one sample T is really the same as that for the related samples T test. The only difference is what I've just showed you in how the initial difference scores are calculated in that for the one sample T test they're calculated relative to the null hypothesis value rather than being um, the difference between the two experimental conditions for each person as they were for the related samples t-test. So here let's work out the value of t for our alcohol example in the one sample t-test. Uh, here are um, the difference scores that are copied across from the other table with the mean difference score being 0.2 compared to the null hypothesis value of 15. Now the standard deviation of those different schools is 4.14, which you can see is a pretty large value relative to that mean, isn't it? So that already gives us a clue that this won't be a significant result because the uh, standard deviation, which is going to form the basis of the standard error, is large. N, as before, in the other example, is 5. So to calculate the standard error, we go 4.4, which is the standard deviation of the different scores, divided by the square root of the sample size, which is 5. So that gives us 4.14 divided by 2.23, which is the square root of 5. And that gives us an answer of 1.85. That's our standard error. Then the T statistic is the mean difference, which was 0 0.2, divided by that standard error of 1.85, gives us a t-value of 0 0.107. And remember that in the last week's lecture, I said that any t-value of less than 1 means that the, uh, we're quite unlikely to get a significant result, because obviously the variation due to the experimental independent variable is less than the random variation in the data. And indeed it turns out that the p-value is 0.46 even though this was a one-tailed prediction. That is not less than 0.05 so the result of this t-test is non-significant. Okay, given that we've got a non-significant result now in one of our examples, let's take a look at reporting non-significant results because this is something that people often find harder than, than reporting the significant ones. It's hard to find the right form of words or people just get confused about what the meaning of a non-significant result is. Now this is what you might write we found no evidence that students consume more alcohol than other people in their age group. The important phrase here is we found no evidence. We'd write T, 4 degrees of freedom, equals 0 0.10, P, greater than 0.05 NS. Now NS is short for non-significant, and notice that we're using this greater than sign for non-significant results and writing in the alpha level that we used which was 0 0.05 and is in most experiments 0 0.05 we're not using the equal sign that we use for significant results when we have a significant result we say what the exact p-value was but when it's non-significant, we just say that the p-value was greater than the cutoff we chose, or alpha, and that's usually 0 0.05. So, in general, when the test is significant, report the exact p-value using equals, 
but when the p-value is greater than 0 0.05 and therefore the test is non-significant, do not report the exact p-value, just write p greater than 0 0.05 comma ns. Now I'm laboring this point because you know you need to do this in your lab reports and people often make mistakes in their lab reports doing this. So do refer back to these slides when you write up your lab reports. Now the other sort of error, other than errors of reporting non-significant results, is errors of really understanding what it means when there's a non-significant result. <clears throat> what it means is that it's more than 5% likely that you could obtain an effect of the independent variable as large or larger than the one you got just by random sampling from a single population. Now, that doesn't mean that the two experimental conditions are, quotes, the same, which is what people often do right. A non-significant difference doesn't mean that the two things are the same. In the morning versus afternoon reaction time example, if the p-value had been 0.23, then the correct conclusion would be that the experiment has not found evidence that reaction times differ as a function of the time of day. But that's not the same as saying that reaction times are the same in the morning and the afternoon. In a way, what it means is that if you've got a bigger sample size, you might have found a significant difference, or you might not. You really just can't conclude much at all from p-values that are greater than 0 0.05. It's just the absence of evidence. Now, if you really wanted to show um, that reaction times were just the same in the morning and in the afternoon, um, you'd get a big sample. You'd do something called a power analysis, which is covered in year two. Uh, and, of course, the actual difference between the reaction times in the morning and the afternoon would have to be close to zero. It never will be exactly zero, but um, it could be close. And if you had enough data, there would then be a way of trying to sh show that effectively morning and afternoon reaction times were the same. But this is something you will not cover until year two. So all you do for non-significant results is just say that there's no evidence of a difference. Now finally, just to revisit effect size, that's the Cohen's D, for the case of the repeated measures and one sample t-tests. The formula is actually even simpler. Um, the mean of the different scores divided by the standard deviation of the different scores. Remember that the mean of the different scores is equivalent to the difference between the two sample means in an independent sample t-test. Both are just ways of telling you what the effect of the independent variable on the dependent variable is. And that is the end of this week's lesson.